Welcome to this webinar on how to write a PhD research proposal. We're delighted that you could join us. Firstly, let me introduce myself. Uh, my name is Jonathan Lloyd. I work in the university's graduate school and I'm very pleased today to be joined by Dr. Yulia Vogt, Director of PhD Research Studies in our School of Psychology and Clinical Language Sciences. So I just wanted to briefly outline um, what we're going to cover in this webinar. So a number of PhD applications don't progress because of the research proposal. Today, we're going to help you understand a bit more about what is expected in a research proposal, which we hope will help you as you look to develop your ideas and apply for a PhD. After Yulia has gone through the presentation part of the webinar, then we'll move on to answering some of your questions. So um, how to answer a question. Um, the, on the slide here on your screen, you can see um, that you need to click uh, questions there uh, and then you can put a, a question in to us. Um, it's slightly different um, on a mobile phone if you're using a smartphone today. Um, but do um, send in questions um, as you think of them. And um, what we'll do is we'll plan to pick those up at the end uh, when Yulia's uh, finished the presentation part of the webinar and we'll do as uh, as many questions as we can uh, within the time that we have. So uh, yeah, do send us in your questions. So um, I'd like to invite Yulia to start us off now pr by providing um, some information about a research proposal. So um, thanks, Yulia. Thank you, John. A warm welcome also for me. I'm really pleased to see so many of you here and really thank you for your interest in our university and in doing a PhD with us. Let's get started with um, how to write a proposal. The next slide, please. So what is the purpose of the proposal? When you submit an application or when you send us a proposal, like the first thing that we look at is what are your research interests? So that is why I look into your proposal. And that is how I start reading your proposal. And another thing is also then when I look at your proposal and I see what are your research interests, I also look into who for my colleagues or who may be in the entire university. So we have some topics or some proposals might come in and I might decide it's not for our department, but it might be for another department. So who could supervise this research? And is there somebody that could supervise this research? Very important question. We will come back later to that. I also look at the proposal and see um, what kind of f facilities or support would that research need? So is it certain machines or instruments that would be needed and do we have them? Or is it some kind of um, supervision or, or kind of training that you would need and can we provide that? Of course, I also look at the proposal and want to see is that research that provides a novel or an, maybe an extended contribution? So is it something that is, that is important to know about either theoretically or practically? Or for instance, has it impact? So we don't want to do research like what you might have sometimes done as an undergraduate student, just a repetition of something that has already been done. That's really a switch at the, at the PhD level. It needs to be research that is novel or an extension or an application of research. We want to do research that will advance a research. When I'm looking at your proposal, of course, I also can make a little bit of a judgment about um, your skills and knowledge. So I can, for instance, see whether you, you can write. And please don't be worried. I don't expect you to be right perfectly, but I can see whether you have the potential to become a really good researcher and a researcher that can write. And I can also see, for instance, whether you have skills that are important. So whether you, for instance, based your, your, your proposal on existing research and you kind of refer to existing research and cite other research. Next slide, please. So ideally, your proposal should have a clear title and description of the research topic. So make make clear that that we understand what what your proposal is about. Don't make it too vague. So sometimes I get proposals where people say they could study like anything. Like um, I'm a psychologist, they, so they would say they could study memory or language or attention. That's a bit too broad. So make it clear what what you want to study. Um, 
Also, and that's really, really important, have a look at the university, have a look at the department where you want to work at and see what, what research we are doing or what research that department is doing and see how it links with it. So my biggest problem is often that I get a lot of proposals and often they are brilliant, but it's not something anyone in my department could supervise. So have a look and maybe you reach out to us before you submit a proposal and see how it links. And maybe there is a way you have an idea and then you see, oh, there are somebody who's doing something similar and then you kind of link it a bit better to our department and to the, that colleague. The proposal should explain what will be involved in conducting the research and what resources will be required. So for instance, what I said before, what machines or instruments you need. You should highlight these novel contributions and impact. So for instance, could be something simple that you say you will extend existing research to maybe your country or to another group of participants or to another problem. It depends on the um, respective field, but it's it, you don't need to invent something entirely new. It can often be that it's a very needed and very relevant extension. The proposal should bring across a bit of motivation and also we should um, see from the proposal, you you know the literature, you have read about it. It's not just that you have read one, one article about it, you have read a few articles and you have thought it through. It should be well written and presented, so it's not good when there are a lot of typos because then it just feels like it has been written in a rush. But don't be worried, like you will probably hear, I'm not a native speaker. If you are not a native speaker, we, we have much patience if we just see it's, it's a matter of uh, the English not being entirely perfect. We don't expect that, but we, we expect it to be um, looking in a way proper, so properly formatted and everything. Also be prepared as often that, that, that the proposal that you submit um, is not the final version. It's often just in a way to start a discussion with the department. So first with me and then I will probably connect you with some of my colleagues and they will say, oh, this is interesting. But I would suggest that we maybe change it a little bit, for instance. And um, so be prepared for that. But that's actually also really fun then to discuss your research and to, to get input from an expert. Next slide, please. And then I give over to John, who will tell you a little bit about um, existing PhD opportunities and existing students in our department. Thank you. Yeah, I, I always get very excited um, when looking at pictures of our, our students doing a really amazing things that they're doing so i'm just going to just go through some of these images here up on the screen so uh, top left we've got melanie she's down at the special collections um resource that we have down at london road and she's actually doing some research on the first uh, female mp to take up a seat in parliament so really really interesting research that she's doing there as we move across to the center at the top there that's mark and he's um from the film theater and television department doing work on Japanese punk film from the 1970s and he's there in Japan actually with a Japanese film director. Moving to the right there uh, we've got Ben who's talking to the um, um, BBC there. He's actually a student in biological sciences um, talking about hedgehog decline in the UK which is a an environmental concern that we have at the moment. Just coming down to the middle there on the right hand side, and um, that's Lydia. Um, she did a PhD in politics. She's actually there at the doctoral research conference that we have. It's a, a really exciting event that we have every year where we get all our community of researchers together on campus and we sort of celebrate all of the diversity of what they're doing and the quality also of their research. And she's actually in the poetry rhyme and rap competition there. Um, and she's she's playing the part of a scientist, you can see with the lab coat on her shoulder, but also a politician as well. She's playing both sides of the, the story there. Um, so moving uh, to the centre, that's um, Vincent from uh, Yulia's school actually, Psychology and Clinical Language Sciences, and he is there with the MRI scanner, which is in the school, which is an amazing piece of equipment for us to be able to have. Um, and a lot of research goes on there. And he was doing uh, research on bilingualism and the brain. So just moving to the left center picture, that is our um, one of our training rooms actually in the graduate school. We have our own building here at Reading. Um, 
we're very fortunate to have that. And this is one of our uh, Reading Researcher Development Programme training sessions where we do very small workshops um, throughout the year in transferable skills. And there's about 70 of those that run during the year. So that's and it's very positively received by our students. Just moving down to the bottom left there, that's Liz. She's um, actually presenting our Fairbrother public lecture, which is when one of our PhD researchers talks um, publicly in a lecture theatre here and members of the public and local community come and um, is another way of us showcasing the excellent quality of uh, doctoral research at the university. And just moving to the centre at the bottom there, that's Adatunji, and he was studying in environmental science, um, and he was doing some field work there on soil uh, microbiology and um, climate change, the impact of climate change on, on, on that. And finally, bottom right, is Mohammed with his supervisor, Chris, um, and they're in the School of Biological Sciences with a very, very expensive microscope there. And uh, Mohammed was doing some research on um, platelets and blood clotting and that sort of thing. So that's just a little snapshot of the diversity of our community. Um, and um, yeah, I'm gonna hand back to uh, Yulia now to uh, continue with the presentation. Thank you very much. And I would totally agree. We have very, very diverse groups of students uh, at the university. So if you, for instance, would look at my lab, I have students from the Americas to the Middle East and Asia, and we really enjoy that. And we're really proud of that. It, it enhances our research. So how do you find your topic? Um, so first of all, of course, you have to ask what broad area within your discipline interests you. So be careful when you approach us, like what I shortly mentioned before, and you say, well, I'm interested in, actually, I'm interested in, in anything, that sometimes it's a bit tricky for a PhD. In a PhD, you need to decide a little bit more. And often a good indication is, for instance, what were you trained in very much, because it's difficult to start um, a PhD on something you, you haven't really done before even if it's within your broader field, but then also to see what, what did you, what did really interest you, what excited you. And then also to think, well, will I be um, motivated to work on this topic for several years? And maybe also, does it fit with your long-term plan? So for instance, if you want to do the PhD, but afterwards uh, want to work in industry, is this topic a good topic that will lead um, to a good career in industry? Or if you want to stay in academia, is this topic something you want to lecture on for the rest of your life? That's a good way to think about it. And then, of course, you, you can ask more specific questions. What questions do you want to explore or answer? So what really, it's often about what are you passionate about? What do you find really interesting? Where do you feel like this is something I would be happily spend a few years of, of my life on? And sometimes we can also help with that. We, when you approach us, we can kind of explore that with you and kind of uh, help you to find, uh, make a decision there, especially if you feel like you are interested in a lot of things, which is often good. Um, and then to kind of um, pin that down. And then you, of course, need to think about your study or your case study, and you um, will have to think how you can answer um, those questions in a PhD thesis. Like what I mentioned before, it should be original, it should be a new piece of research. I mean, you can replicate or extend existing research, but you should add to the literature. That's really important for a PhD. And of course, it should be viable. So sometimes we get research uh, proposals that are wonderful, but that would not be possible to do in a, in a three years, either because it's, um, it would take too much um, time. Sometimes it's also because it would be too expensive. So like, for instance, in psychology or maybe also in pharmacy, so you have a certain limit of how many people you could test, of course. But again, that is also something where we can help you to kind of, um, make your proposal a bit um, a bit more viable when we read the first version that might be where we give you feedback and say well think about is that really possible to do next slide please so what should your proposal include it should be a title not too long but it should be descriptive a brief introduction to the topic and why it matters so quick basically a quick literature review the key research questions, we often recommend that that are kind of three questions because we often think of three empirical chapters in a PhD. So what are you investigating? 
discussing discussion of existing scholarships, what I mentioned before, the introduction should have an element of literature review that you describe what is known in that field and what is still a knowledge gap. You should discuss methods, approaches and sources. Um, that's, I also see that for many of my colleagues that's really important that they see that a student has an idea how you can test something. Then, of course, so you have often have one big research question and then you have these sub questions and subtopics. Um, so your question might be about in psychology it would be something how to treat depression or trying a specific treatment for depression and then it would have sub 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 chapters, for instance, existing treatments and then a, a trial study or something like that. You can you do not need to include the timetable for completion but what my recommendation would always be even if you don't do not include the timetable that in your mind you have kind of thought about can i do this what i'm proposing there in three years basically so and that is also how we look at it there should be a conclusion an expected outcome so when I read a research proposal, I want to kind of get a feeling, okay, this is important. This is research that will advance that specific field. Of course, please do also include a bibliography of your references and further key reading. And that's sometimes where I also have a look. It's not good when that are just website or only papers that are from 1940, 50, 60. So there's where I see, well, do you cite the relevant journals in the field and do you cite newer um, literature and do you cite journals and not just uh, Wikipedia or something that would not be so good. It's often nice to see illustrations, but that depends on the field and on the topic. So I think you, you might know better whether that's something useful for your um, own proposal. Next slide, please. How long? That's really something important. So in general, I tried already to mention that a few times. It's really important that you look at the department website. So one, what I mentioned before, to see what kind of research they are doing and how could your proposal fit in, but also for the length. So for instance, in psychology, we just want in the first instance, we want a very short proposal, 500 words. So look at the sites. Um, most departments here want something between 2,000 and 4,000 words, but really have a, have a look at it, what, what the department wants. Um, and also there might be other specific instruction. And it's really good when you show that you have engaged with it, because otherwise sometimes it comes a little bit across like proposals have been sent to many universities, um, which I can understand is probably efficient approach to apply for a PhD. But you do not make the best impression. It's best when we get the feeling, oh, you really thought about Reading and you want to come to Reading. So then you get um, a bit more attention from us. The word count, of course, does not in include title, references, figure le legends or tables. And again, like if, if it's useful for your research, it can be really good to, to include a picture. And that also shows that you really thought about it and engaged a little bit with it. Next slide, please. So the background, the what and why. So when I start reading a proposal, I kind of want, want to get engaged. I want to understand what is this about? What is the proposal about? So what I already mentioned before, not to wait, not, not that you say, well, I want to study. I'm interested in everything. It's better if it's a bit more focused. Um, and I also want to get a feeling why that is important. And that can be because it's, it's very, very relevant from an applied perspective, but it can also be because you lead to a theoretical advancement or you develop a new method but that should really come across in the introduction so there should be this has been done and this is what i want to do and this is why that is uh, relevant so review prior work what is already known in the area what is not yet known um, find relevant work by reading publications from from for instance from the university i mean that's often quite nice um, my colleagues would be very interested when you link it to their own work because then they feel okay that that student knows my work and really wants to work with me. But also, of course, um, use Google Scholar or PubMed or what, whatever database is best for your field and find um, relevant articles and, and show that you have engaged with the literature. 
that does not need to be perfect, but there needs to be a bit of engagement. So what I mentioned before, sometimes we get proposals where only a Wikipedia site is um, referenced, and, and that's simply not enough. So there needs to be uh, references to the academic literature. And then what I already mentioned before, we are really looking to see is that a good topic? Is that a good idea? Is that something somebody should do research on? But also, can we do this at Reading? Can we supervise that at Reading? And we really mean that from a, from a very caring perspective towards you, if we don't have the expertise here, we would not be good supervisors for you. So we need to see that the project is something we could supervise and whether a supervisor could really help you to become a good researcher and could help you to get that research done. So we look at, is it appropriate for us? Have you engaged with the literature and are um, the ideas expressed in a way what we would expect from an, um, somebody who enters into a PhD program? Again, it doesn't need to be perfect in that way, but there needs to be a certain clarity to it and a certain kind of idea how to do it and how to talk about research. Next slide, please. So that is Mohamed, what you heard about before. Okay, now let's go a bit deeper into the proposal. So first, so you, after having written the background, you need to identify research questions. So what is the main research question? Do phrase this as a clear question. That's a recommendation we would give. Um, and then often how a PhD is built up, you have a big question. So let's give let's give you an example. So for instance, I've one student supervised at Henley Business School who looked at the role of expression of anger in organizations. If you get angry about people, what is is that problematic or is that not a problem? So his big question would have been, what is the role of anger in organizations? And then he would have developed like sub questions that would have helped him to kind of structure the proposal, like um, how can anger be expressed in a good way? Or another one would have been, um, what can an organization do to lead to better expression of anger? Um, so often that is then the case that these sub questions kind of form different chapters of the PhD. And when we look at the proposal, we, all, we already want to see a little bit like, okay, this is how this PhD would be built. Don't try to sit there and come up with, with a brilliant question. Really read the literature. And I often find when I feel I run out of ideas, I read a paper and then I think, oh, this this is missing. This is something that needs to be done. So really use the literature as a help. Next slide, please. So again, when you look into the papers, you will see what has already been done because as mentioned before, you, we, we don't want just to repeat research. We want to extend it, but maybe there's like a little extension. Like for instance, maybe research has only been done in one country or has been very limited in certain ways. It often helps to state hypothesis that depends on the field that's often from the sciences. I think in the humanities and arts that will be very different. Um, but again, we want to see that that research fits in with our research in Reading and also in order to be really good supervisors to you and to help you develop that um, research. But we also want to see that it's good research, that will be research we will be proud of coming out of Reading, like the pictures that, that John mentioned in the beginning, that for all students where we felt like, wow, they are uh, producing great research that um, is um, good for Reading and that shows that what we are doing in Reading. Next slide, please. So for the literature review, we really have a look what what others already have said, because you can imagine like if an academic is reading your proposal and you propose it as your own idea and then I read it and think, well, people have been suggesting that for 50 years, then that doesn't sit so well. It might always be that you propose something and that only recently has been proposed by one other person, then, then I would not judge you so harshly. But if it's something that is known in the field for several years, uh, then I would have expected you that you would have come across that when doing the, your literature review. So often when I read such proposals, I know that you haven't done a proper literature review. 
be specific, so use the um, citation rules of your specific um, field. And what's often a good way to find a proposal is to link different arguments by different scholars. So you say, oh, this person says this and this person says this. So how does that link together? That's often a good way to find a really good research question. Um, and then also really highlight how you will build your research on existing research. So what we really don't, um, I hope this doesn't come across like this, but it's really a PhD is not about um, inventing an entire field or something. It's really like somebody once said to me, standing on the shoulder of giants. So you use what's already there and you kind of build something of your own out of it. So often it's, it's, it's an extension, but a very valuable extension, an important extension. So it might be that you simply extend something. It might be that you challenge something, that you read something and say, I don't think that that will work in this and this situation, and that is what you will test. And also you might simply be, be filling a gap. Um, it's important that you are positive about existing scholarship. It would, it would be a bit weird if you just say everything what is, has been written in that field is not very good. I think try to express scientifically what are um, gaps or what are problems in the field. Um, and then, of course, it also helps if you maybe, for instance, start your literature review with the relation to existing research. Next slide, please. Methods is really important. I mean, that depends on the field. I think psychology is a bit more sciencey, but also the sciences. But I, I see that in general. Often proposals are very much read for um, has a student an understanding of methods. And we don't expect that to be perfect, but we want to see a little bit that we see somebody can already think about methods. Maybe not how we would do it, but but there's a basic understanding of methods. So think about what methods, techniques and approaches would be best. So how would you answer that question? And then also what, what kind of uh, equipment, facilities, archives, sources would you, would you require? And are they available at the university? Have you thought about it? Because often we read proposals where it sounds fascinating, but we feel like we, we could not support that. Um, so I sometimes read proposals where people say they want to test people in a certain country, but they don't make clear how we would get access to uh, these participants. So mention then maybe that you would use a contact at a local university to get access to these participants. That would be one example. So what experiments or whatever your way of studying is would be conducted? Um, what do you plan to build? Also talk a little bit about the data. What data will you collect and how do you propose to analyze those data? Um, and if it's, for instance, qualitative work, what approaches theories will you use in analyzing the data? So that's often where I see my colleagues have a very, very close look. Does somebody have an idea how to go about the empirical part of, of the work? And again, what we are looking to see is this research feasible at Reading? Is it something we can support? What other support might be required and how clear is the applicant at this stage on what is needed? Because it can be very tricky when somebody has very, very unrealistic plans um, to, to start a research project with them. Next slide, please. So what we expect is like to, to kind of a little bit to be able to gauge from the from the proposal is um, how will this research advance current knowledge so that we get an idea, okay, this research will add this or that. What we, will be the impact of your results? And of course we get excited when we feel, oh, this is really an advancement. It's, it's, um, it will have impact, it will allow the field to move on. And that could, for instance, also be that it will open new avenues of research. Important is also good research can be used by others. So that might also be a question that we use. Um, and is it an hypothesis that is worth investing in? So basically, we are looking at what's the potential for novel contributions to the field. But could this, could this research advance the field? Could it need to new research? Could it need to new applications to new impact? Next slide, please. That is just one example of a PhD student supervisor in our special collections. I don't know, John, do you know who that is? Or is that just a picture that you 
um, found. I'm afraid the name escapes me, but I do know who it is, but I just can't um, can't remember right know. now. But yeah, it's yeah. down in the special collections room, um, which is a um, just a place where you can look at particular resources. And I know this is a typography student in a, a department of typography who's looking at some different um, characters here uh, with the supervisor. Oh, it looks looks very impressive what they're doing. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Next slide, please. So a few words on writing and presentation. Make make sure your proposal is written clearly and logical. So what I was talking about before, like really, this is the what's known in the research. This is what I want to study, and this is how I will study, and then this is the contribution. Try to use appropriate language for your academic field. I mean, it's it's sometimes difficult because that is something that you learn over the years. So if you're a bit uncertain, then rather keep it simple. So don't use words that you don't understand, because if you don't understand them, it will, it will, when reading such proposals, I can see that you're just using words without understanding them. So then rather keep it simple. Scientific writing tends to be concise and to the point. That's really important. So really don't, don't fill the, the pages with just um, talking about something without adding really new um, ideas or new points. Be concise. Subheadings can be really useful. Um, to structure a proposal. Bullet points can also be good, especially for research questions, sometimes really nice. So these are my three or four research questions. And uh, if you add a timetable, that's often also really nice in a figure or in a, in a table. But in, otherwise, we expect full sentences. So instance, for the literature review, I very, very seldom get that in bullet points. That is not appropriate. That should be full sentences. And then, uh, of course, make sure that you also, in your um, at the end of your proposal, in, the, in your bibliography, you have the references that you mentioned in the proposal. And because we often look into that, it might just be that I'm just interested, and then I pick that up. Next slide, please. Yeah, make sure that um, your bibliography is in the correct order. Which one you use is really depends uh, on your field. So I think we are also quite flexible. Like in psychology, for instance, it would be APA, but if it's Harvard style, um, we can live with that. But there should be some some structure and then some format to it. Be very careful to not plagiarize. Like often when you read papers, then what happens is that you just copy how these authors expressed it, because in that moment, you can't think of another way to express it. So often when you prepare a proposal, I think it's important to read, but then to put the papers away and write it in your own words. That's also important because we can often test, um, there are simple websites where you can test whether something is copied from other websites. So we, we immediately see that, so be careful with that. There's no correct voice. We, we can live with active and passive voice. I think it's for us, it's also often more about, a little bit more about the context. And then do a spell check and, and proofread. If there are, again, like um, what I mentioned at the beginning, I'm not a native speaker. If there are some wordings in there that maybe a native speaker would not write, that's okay. Don't worry too much about that. But there should be a simple spell check and, and a proofread. So we should get the feeling somebody um, read this several times. Like, for instance, if there are punctuation marks missing, that's obviously a bit confusing. Next slide, please. Have a timeline. If you don't provide it, like what I mentioned before, um, at least you should get the feeling that you thought about that the project is feasible in this amount of time. So divide your project into key tasks. It's often good if it's almost uh, corresponds to the chapter. So maybe this is the first thing I will do, then the second thing, and then the third thing. Um, it could be good to mention milestones or to kind of show what I will find in this study will then influence how I am, um, what I do in the next study. So, for instance, for us, it's sometimes people start with a literature review and that will determine what kind of intervention they want to test. So that would be good to point out. Um, yeah, tables or lists of tasks or Gantt chart is really useful. But the key question is really we want to see, is this achievable? Can this be... Um, does a student make roughly 
realistic predictions for this project. It might still be, I mean, if you don't get that perfectly, that is fine. It might still be that we say, well, let's take that study out. But we get very hesitating when it's something where we feel this would take 10 years. Next slide, please. Yeah, so you need um, to reference your proposal, like what I said before, use one style, which one it is, I think most people are a bit flexible, but look on the department websites because they might have um, specific expectations. Um, use up-to-date information, so do not just reference papers from the 70s or 60s, I think there should be some newer literature in cite original work, do not cite Wikipedia, it's not so good. Um, Avoid using review papers. I mean, sometimes you you can use it, but if you kind of describe an experiment, for instance, in my field, and 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 or you describe several existing experiments, you say this these are the experiments that have been done, and then you always just reference a review paper that has reviewed these experiments, then I would think well, you should have read the original papers and you should reference them here. So really what's important, we want to see what's the latest research on this topic because we also want to get a feeling, is this timely what you are suggesting or has this already been solved? And we also want to see that you have at least basic um, abilities in selecting and using references. Next slide, please. You need, will need time, especially when you enter you in competitions, they all have, it's complicated often, that they all have different demands, so we might have to change the proposal around with it, because for instance, they might have different word limits. Be careful with that, you really need to check the word limits, it could be that you are over the word limit and they will disregard your application. It is often good, especially when you go for the funding competition, you really need to work with your supervisor and you need to have several rounds. So just do not just send it to them two days before the deadline. The ones where I see we got them through, they worked normally for weeks, not if not even months with the supervisor. And supervisors are busy people. They might have some teaching or some marking to do. So keep that in mind and also talk to them about when they would need it to provide you feedback. Have somebody do proofreading and of course, good luck. And next slide, please. A quick summary. So the length, format and order of research proposals can depend on your subject of interest. Check our websites um, for anything, not just the length, but also for um, whatever they, they want specifically. Look at the department's research area and staff profiles and also you can contact staff directly or you often, good way is also to contact the PGR director, so people like me and ask them to make a contact or people in the graduate school like John, we are all very, very happy to help you. Um, you don't have to identify a supervisor before you apply. That is also where we can really help you to identify a supervisor and read our general guidance on how to write a research before, proposal before you apply. So that's actually my, my biggest recommendation and I think also from the graduate school that you kind of engage. We really try to give you very clear and helpful information. John, is there something you want to add to that? Or? No, I think that's, that's all um, really good advice there um, and I think yeah doing the research on the department um, and looking on the website for specific information because there are some local differences in terms of what is needed in a proposal I can think of one example where they would like a particular form filled in and other examples where they want particular uh, word limits so do do please have a look at that don't just apply with whatever you've written just in case you're going to not be meeting the requirements there yeah absolutely yeah, and these are some other tips, but I think we already covered most of them. So like what, why and how is basically a good guide for a good proposal. And yeah, and I think really look at our graduate school website. I think there's really a lot of work went into it to kind of provide you with information, also examples. That's, um, and also on this, for instance, our school's websites also has a lot of examples of successful PhD students and their research. And then our other schools also have that, so that's also a really good resource. 
Yeah, absolutely. Can I just jump in about funding and say, um, basically, the university has quite a, a large uh, range of funding available and um, it's actually now is a great time to be looking at that because a number of the competitions are open at the moment. Um, so do have a look at the graduate school um, website after this uh, webinar and look under uh, fees and funding and then you'll find all of the, the funding there. We tend to call it studentships, that's the kind of word we tend to use, but it's basically scholarships, bursaries um, and things like that. Some of them are for fees only, some of them are a full package with a, a, what we call a stipend, which is a maintenance grant as well. And they tend to be, uh, some of them are general, some of them are focused in specific areas in doctoral training partnerships that we're part of. So please do, do have a look at these um, things and um, we hope that yeah if you have any questions about any of those you can obviously ask the graduate school which I'll um, give you details of here now um, so there's just some uh, ways in which you can contact us um, different ways on social media um, that's the the graduate schools accounts there and also you, if you send an email um, to us at gradschool at reading.ac.uk then um, if you have questions or any follow-ups after this uh, webinar then please contact us there and we'll do our best to to help you. Um, we're now going to move over to uh, looking at questions so if you do have any questions that have arisen from what uh, Yuli has said there um, about your research proposal um, then do put those into the, uh, the, the panel um, on your screen and then we'll do our best to answer those. If there's any that we can't answer today, then um, we'll ask you to email us and then we can definitely find out the answer and get back to you. Um, so do please put some questions in for us. Um, I can see that we do have uh, one question here, which is, can I visit the collections room at the university to help me with research on writing my proposal? Well, the, the special collections that we've actually re referred to a couple of times because we've got photographs of students in there, um, it's like an archive of amazing resources to, that we are conducting or able to conduct res research on. So there was an example of um, the uh, first female MP to take up Parliament, a seat in Parliament, which I mentioned, and there's lots of letters and documents relating to this, which is quite a long time ago now. So, and we've got some very historic books like first publications that sort of thing so in my understanding it's not really a resource for you to work out how to write a, pre a research proposal for your PhD it's more if you're doing a specific piece of research on a document that we might have within that archive then you request that document to be brought out for you and you're studying it in your research and then it goes back into the archive so I don't think that's quite the right place to be helping with your um, research proposal but if you were to look at the graduate school website um, and the how to apply link on the website on the home page there then we do go through um, some uh, more information about how to write a pro uh, proposal and as, as I mentioned already and Yuli has mentioned as well looking on the department website is perhaps uh, another thing to definitely do in tandem with that look at them both and then hopefully that will help you and as Yuli has also said you know, talking to your supervisor or asking your postgraduate uh, director of research studies um, if there's a particular part of your proposal that you're you know struggling with or unsure about you can ask them um, for advice I don't know Yuli if you want to add anything to that well, I was just thinking I think we have the largest Samuel Beckett um, arch archive out don't we so I think if somebody would do a PhD on Samuel Beckett I think we, they would probably be allowed to use it and yeah Yes, yeah, um, that that's true. Um, yeah, I mean, if you're if you're working on a proposal for something you know is in the special collections, then I think that's an entirely different matter. Sorry, yes, I should have uh, I should have said that. I don't know if we have any other questions um, now that you'd like to to send us in. please ask questions also really i think it's really important that you see it's often better to before you submit a um, application to uh, send an email to the to the pgr the director to somebody like me and it's, it's it's also then good then we know that your application is coming and um it um um so if, if you then after that just submit it but often it's then that we say okay let's let's have a closer look and let's let's see how we maybe change the proposal for instance to make it more um 
aligned with threading or with threading interests. I don't know if I can just, just pop in. Um, my name's Claire. I work in the global recruitment team here at the, the university. Um, there's just a couple of questions that I can see that have popped up, um, which possibly are not visible on your screen. So apologies for that. Do you want me to, to read them yeah. out and you guys take them? Okay. Um, we've got a question here that's related to when prospective PhD students can apply. Uh, for example, can I apply while I'm still completing my master's research? Yeah, I mean, done. You pop, they can, no? Like, I mean, that's no problem. You often even have to, if you go for funding, you have to apply during a master's course. So. Yeah, I mean, that's very common um, that you would be studying uh, an undergraduate program or a master's program, and during that, you need to apply for a, a PhD place, whether it's funded or unfunded, often these, you know, you, you need a number of months in advance of, of, of that to be working on your application before the, the start date would come up. So yes, um, that's absolutely fine. And um, if you were to apply, what you'd likely get would be a conditional offer um, saying that it, you know, we would be delighted to accept you, but you would need to get a certain grade or mark in your current degree whether it's a, a bachelor's degree or a master's degree um, so that that's absolutely normal and happens a lot um, and just to mention about the kind of degrees that um, are, are required in the science areas um, it is possible to go from a bachelor's degree with a 2-1 or above uh, directly into a PhD um, some candidates do that some candidates also have a master's but in the social sciences, arts and humanities and the business side is very often that a master's degree would be required. And I think just to make it clear also, if you're applying for funding, a master's degree can really strengthen your application for funding. Um, so, um, yeah, that's just about the kind of um, qualifications just broadly that we, we look for for PhD applicants. Thank you. Um, we've got a, another question here, which is related to perhaps doing the, the PhD overseas um, asking how much supervision would be available for researchers who are working abroad and I, I think it's somebody who's perhaps experienced doing a master's degree online with another university and felt that perhaps they didn't have a huge amount of support from the, the university so I don't know if you could perhaps touch a bit on on the studying from a distance if that is possible and what support would be available. So maybe I start with that because I have several by distance PhD students um, you get the same support as um, as my PhD students that are here in Reading. So we meet via via Teams or any other video software, um, and we make very sure to meet to meet with you. And uh, for instance, I hold my my lab meetings online so that my students in Singapore, wherever they are, can can join. Um, What's maybe important to understand is, the, is that the by distance degree is, is not an online degree. So we would normally expect you to, to fly in for some of the um, taught elements, but we have very little taught elements in a PhD degree in Reading. Maybe John, you could um, add to that. Yeah, sure. So the, the, the PhD by distance is predominantly for people who are obviously based outside of the UK um, and have other commitments or other reasons why they uh, need to be based where they are. Um, the supervision would be through um, like a video chat call like this sort of thing or by email. Um, there's some transferable skills training which is provided online through the graduate school and um, obviously you'd have electronic access to the library resources at the university. Um, and it's down to really the approval of the supervisors um, in terms of the project. Is it suitable for studying it in that way? Um, obviously, if you're going to need, you know, uh, lab resources, for example, or other, other resources that we have on campus here, but they're not available elsewhere, then that's more tricky, but that can be arranged sometimes. Um, and in terms of what Julia says about um, lectures and things, I mean, in the, in the most part, there probably aren't lectures that you'd have to attend in, in the majority of cases that I'm aware of. Um, but there is, there might be some particular requirements that a specific department has. 
um, and we have it's quite flexible in terms of when students do come and don't come it's sort of arranged as part of the discussions before setting up you know before starting the PhD so um, I think there's quite a lot of flexibility there it's, a, it's available on a full and a part-time basis um, and again that's something that there is some information on our website about Great, thank you. Um, another question about the actual sort of application process um, and a question about how do you actually get access to a supervisor? I don't know if you've got any guidance about that. I mean, you can simply email them. Um, that's, I mean, most colleagues um, would, would also be very happy about that, especially if you have engaged with their research. Like if you, what we, what we really recommend is like if you looked at the department website, looked over the different profiles and then really got stuck on one person, started reading their papers um, and really like it. I mean, most people would be really pleased to get such an email, like I read your papers and I'm really fascinated by it or I, I'm, I'm interested in it. So that's often a good way to approach it. If you find that a bit scary to directly approach an academic, then uh, email somebody like me um, or email the graduate school. Um, or, or a kind of submit a request and we can then also put, directly put you in touch with people but um academics really like that so it's it's um we, we, we and we really try to facilitate that Brilliant. And then following on from that, um, a, a question from somebody who's asking about um, whether research interests might be interdisciplinary. Uh, for example, they might be interested in doing psychology, but perhaps an overlap with literature. How would they know which department to approach in the first instance? Well, that's a great question. Um, I, I'm actually supervising PhD students who are in, in business. I, um, I'm, I'm not sure whether anybody has done literature. I would reach out to the PhD, PGR directors in both departments, maybe send an email to them both at the same time and, and ask about it. Um, I, I mean, I can't promise that it works out every time. You would need in both departments, be, you would need to have academics that are interested in it. But I think in Reading, we are quite good in working interdisciplinary and um, and often it's great to have this why are PhD students. So just reach out. It might work. What I say, I can't promise it will work out, but I think you would at least uh, people would look into it whether it is possible. Right. Thank you very much. Um, a question going back to the studentships, which are, I know, John, you've already spoken a little bit about those. Um, are any studentships available if people are thinking about starting in January 22 rather than September? Right. So yeah that's a good question um actually most of the studentships that we have and, and the funding um schemes that we have are for a september start each year it just tends to be that that's the time when the funding the funders uh make that available so it's it's more difficult to find something for january what you might find is the occasional uh, specific project that might start earlier because the funding is different and the timing therefore is different or can be more flexible um, but I think it's a matter of having a look on our website I think really because the funding situation is an ever-changing picture um, we've got something in Yulia's school at the moment that's being advertised um, at the moment and there's um, other other things coming up as well and we'll know we know that we'll be expecting further studentship projects um, to be advertised also in the new year and going forward into the spring so it is very it's very varied I mean, I think on the timing of things I see there's another question there about you know when when can I start a PhD and I think that um, the funding obviously dictates if that's what you're looking for or maybe you're going to be funded sponsored from your own country or another uh, self-funded even perhaps um, you you have more control when that's the case perhaps where you're um, self-funded um, we actually have start dates in January and in April as well so it's not a matter of having to wait a whole year for September to come around um, so there is there is that flexibility there but obviously you know if funding is 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 the most important thing then obviously you have to fit in with the schedule of when that's available Okay, and just another question um, relating to the, the application. Um, will the department look just at the proposal or would they possibly interview as well? I would say the, I mean, the proposal needs to um, 
evoke sufficient interest, but normally we, we interview quite a lot. Um, um, but if the proposal is about something where, where I don't see any way that somebody could supervise that, then I might be hesitating to offer um, an interview. But what I normally do is when I get a proposal that we can't supervise it, I say, are there, could you have a look at our website and do you see ways how to link it more? So I try to find a way basically to, to, to get you in. But um, we actually interview a lot. And I think, John, most departments probably interview a lot. Don't like, um... I think um, the um, digital sort of chat, like this sort of thing with a webcam is becoming more and more um, common now. Um, because of the pandemic and uh, for other other reasons and um, yes yeah, so I think I, I know that a lot of students now do have a chat with prospective supervisors to talk about their background and their experience and what they're wanting to do and uh, as we look to to, to arrange a project with them um, so yes um, it's common but it doesn't happen in every case I don't think. Thank you. Um, this is it's quite a good question here actually about where there are actually um, projects advertised by professors um, and I think we do have some of those on the, the graduate school website um, asking whether it would still be necessary to submit a proposal with the application when there is actually one of those advertised projects. Yeah that's a great that's a great question. Um, I think Yulia may want to comment on this as well because I know her school advertises some of these projects that supervisors are looking to do a project in a particular area. They're unfunded projects um, and um, it may be that the, the supervisor would want to have one of these chats with with a super uh, with a student, a prospective student and to find obviously about their background, why they're interested in the project, that sort of thing. But um, whether they would then be asked to do a piece of work to sort of demonstrate this, I'll have to ask uh, Yulia about that. But um, just to mention also, if it's a funded project, the project is set, the supervisors are set, you don't need to do a proposal for that, certainly. But I'll just hand over to Yulia now. I think if it's a funded project, so if somebody basically advertises a PhD position, so to say, so that we cover your fees and, and your stipend, then what I usually see is that they don't expect you to write a proposal, but you want to you want to read the, the ad carefully because maybe they they still want one because maybe they say right how you would exactly do this part of the project. If you uh, see, for instance, the Find a PhD app, or we in psychology, for instance, also have have a document called PhD opportunities where we listed there we would still expect it because simply that's often very very vague and broad so we say we are interested roughly in this and then we would really want to see what exactly you would would kind of want to do in that area and how you would test it but i think that might also be something where you want to reach out to a pgr director or to a colleague to clarify in advance what they expect you to do if if it's not described in the in the ad thank you, thank you. So we're just coming up to the, the end of our time. I think um, perhaps just one final question to, to finish on, um, which relates to English language ahead of starting the PhD and, and whether we have uh, an integrated English programme uh, or sort of preparation course that people can do. I don't know whether that's something, John, you would like to comment on about our pre-sessional courses? Yes, yeah, so we've certainly, we've got an excellent um, ISLI is a center for um, English language basically where you can take a pre-sessional course there and I think they can be up to 12 months they may be shorter depending on your uh, level of English at at the moment um, and um, so you you generally you would come and do that course and then at the end of that you take a test and then um, the majority of students pass the test and reach the required level um, which is a, an equivalent IELTS score or taking our own test. So that's certainly available. There's information on the university's website about the pre-sessional courses and many students um, do come and do that. Some of them are sponsored by their governments, for example, and they get sponsorship for the English course and the PhD as well. Some of them um, are funded in, in various ways, but um, yeah, you can certainly do that. And also another benefit of it is you're living here in Reading, you're familiarising yourself with the university. You can go and chat to your supervisor about your PhD 
uh, project that's coming up and it's a good great way of just settling in before you then start your your PhD research with us so as we've come to, did you want to mention anything on that Yulia no that was you covered everything <laughs> well I think we've come now to the time the end of our time this morning and I'd just like to thank you for um, joining us today and we hope you found the webinar helpful as you look to develop your research proposal um, thank you for your questions um, do contact us um, if we haven't been able to answer your question um, and then we want to uh, try and get back to you and, and I, I, I will do that um, and we'd just like to wish you a, a good day and um, thanks very much to Yulia in particular and to Claire um, for helping with this webinar today and um, yeah thank you very much